Welcome everyone. Welcome to the RNC seminar series. It's great to have you all here with us virtually. Um, and so just as a reminder, please put any questions in the Q&A. You can put them in throughout the talk and at the end, um, I will read them to Lindsay who can answer them. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Richard Squires who is going to introduce our very own Lindsay Groves. Okay, thank you, Allison. <clears throat> It's my, my honor and pleasure to be able to introduce Lindsey Groves. I don't know if I started too soon, but anyway, I'm, I'm proud to introduce uh, Lindsey Groves, who's my friend and colleague. And um, he told me the other day, I think we've known each other 43 years. And that goes right back to really the beginning of my career. I'm a professor emeritus at Cal State University Northridge, also known as CSUN. So about 43 years ago, or you know, plus now retirement, that's um, how long I've, I've known Lindsay. And anyway, it's, it's been a great association. I found someone who loves puns and who loves uh, Simpsons, the Dodgers. Lindsay came to CSUN in 1991 and he worked on his master's thesis with me. And basically I was impressed then, I'm still impressed now at how detailed his work is, how, um, timeless it is. I still use his master's thesis. Uh, you know, I have it near my, my, my hands. So I can get to it and look at it, my own research. He continues to do it and we continue to collaborate and we've got some really long papers in, in basically in review and in preparation. And so it continues even in my retirement, I probably imagine Lindsay's so, so forth. His research concerns primarily a 90 million year interval of time, geologic time from the late Cretaceous to modern day. The fossils that interest him the most, are you ready for it? And there's a word you're gonna hear a lot today, Cyprioidians. And you'll see it spelled out and explained, but they're basically new world Cyprioidians, <laughs> otherwise popularly known as calorie shells. And they are an elegant group of mollusks with their polished and colorful shells and shell collectors throughout the world prize them. And just recently, he's kind of pulled me into his web, I guess you might say, to work on these things. Uh, we've done some papers before, but we continue to do them. So I'm getting more and more knowledgeable about calories. Anyway, Lindsay's expertise will be showcased today in his talk. And you're gonna soon see the title, but to paraphrase it, it deals with these calories or Cyprioidians in the Northern Dominican Republic. And it's a virtual paradise. It'd be a wonderful place to go and collect. I can't imagine how beautiful it must be to experience that. So Lindsay, without any further ado, you know, let's get to it. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, Dick. Thank you, Allison. Um, let's get things started here. When Allison first announced that she was going to be doing the virtual seminars, I had to jump at it because this is such a neat project and we had just uh, finished the manuscript and had submitted it. So I figured, okay, this has got to be a good one for the seminar series. Plus I hadn't given a seminar in close to 10 years, so I'm back. Um, otherwise, well, you'll hear this term a lot today, Cyprioidian, and it's the calorie shells, but it's, I'll give you a better definition in a few minutes. Um, my co-author is Bernie Landau, <clears throat> who's a medical doctor in Albufera, Portugal, and He's a research associate with a PhD in paleontology at the Biodiversity Center in Leiden, the Netherlands. That's you know who on the left in Parkfield, California with that neat sign about entering the North American plate across the San Andreas. And that's Bernie on the right. I've never met him in person, but we've exchanged lots of heated emails back and forth regarding this manuscript many times. Um, agreeing and disagreeing on many times. So these are the topics I'm gonna cover. And it's the early Dominican research, then the more modern Dominican research on the neogene mollusks. Uh, and then some interesting information about the geology, stratigraphy, paleoecology, et cetera. And then get into the meat of the things and the families and the faunas that we've described and then some neat conclusions. But one of the biggest questions here at the beginning, what the heck is a Cyprioidian? And they are the cowrie shells. 
There's four families within the superfamily, the gastropod superfamily Cypraeoidea. And these are local species all found in California. This is Neoburnea spadicea, Neosymnia, Neosymnia arcuata, Pusula solandri, and Hesper irato columbella, which this specimen, by the way, now is a very famous one. It was recently designated as a neotype for that species. Unfortunately, the person doing it put it in the wrong genus. Can't have everything right, I guess. Anyway, so that's the kind of shells we're going to be looking at. And you'll see more and more later on. The first paper describing individual species was published in 1850 by G.B. Sowerby. Um, the specimens were collected by a fellow named Henken, not Heinecker, as you see it misspelled here and here. So somebody really couldn't either read his handwriting or didn't care. And even when he did they described a species, they called it Heinecker eye instead of Henneken eye. Uh, this is the first cowrie described right here. Cypria Henneker eye, as he called it, but it's Henken eye now. There's Sowerby himself in 1820s, I believe, not 1850s. And there's the plate from that paper in the Journal of the Geological Society of London. Not the, it's a copy of a copy, so it doesn't really look that great, but you can still see that, the cowrie shape and everything. And what he's referring to here is occasional irregular tubercles on the posterior of the back or the dorsum. And that's a commonality in all everything in this genus. They have these wart-like looking tubercles on them. And he says it has a resemblance to Cypria moose, which is the living species in the Caribbean today, in Colombia and Venezuela. Unfortunately, the specimen was either lost or it was in a lot that they did not know which one was the actual type. So a lectotype was taken and made the type of that species. And it's in the British Museum. It's from the Miocene, Pliocene part of the, what's called the Cercado Formation in the Dominican. And you can see the small tubercles right up here. They're kind of faint in this one because this is a simp not a full adult, but very, very close. In the late 1860s and the early 1870s, William Gabb went to the Dominican Republic to do a survey. He had done surveys all over California. He made a lot of mistakes. He did a lot of good work though, tremendous amount of work considering there were no maps available at the time in California. And same thing with the Dominican Republic. There had been English geologists, particularly mining geologists there making maps, but he went up into the hills and made some, a few mistakes here and there. But the biggest one was he considered it all one formation. And we're talking about hundreds of feet of sediment here, very, very thick sediments. He called it all one formation, all one age, Miocene, which is in the ballpark. And the biggest goof he made on this paper called on the topography and geology of Santo Domingo, he didn't figure any of the more than 200 species he described, which was kind of par for the course of the, in the 1870s and such, but wait, more coming up. In 1917, this tremendous volume was published by the Bulletins of American Paleontology called the Santo Domingo Type Sections and Fossils by Carlotta Maori. Incredible that she was able to do this and do the field work. The encouragement of G.D. Harris at Cornell University, she went to the Dominican Republic in 1915 and 1916 to do all this collecting, which is just incredible for anybody to do it. But at the time, for a woman to do this, and she's probably had to wear one of these dresses and such in the field, but hats off to her for doing this. And in 1919, she described two formational names, the Cercado and the Garabo, and those names are still used today over a hundred years later. So she did quite a, a job in the Dominican. And it was right around the time where there was an invasion by the US Marines 
So a lot was going on at the time. Plus World War I was going on at the time too. So, wow, hats off to them for doing that. And this is a sample of several of her plates showing the various cowrie shells. There's one right here and then there's an ovulid right here. So tremendous amount of material. She used some of Gab's species, but mostly figures the ones that she collected. In 1922, Henry Pillsbury took on all of Gab's specimens that were at the Academy of Natural Sciences of Philadelphia and illustrated them, including several calories. And he determined type species and lectotypes of a lot of them, which Gab didn't do either. So this is amazing stuff. And we have some of these things on loan and it's just so neat to have them in your hands that these guys collected and touched back in the 1870s and 1920s. A lot of historical information there. William Marcus Ingram came along in the 30s. He went to Pomona College, but he did a lot of work at Cornell University to get his PhD. And he wrote several timely papers on calories on where the types of the fossils were located, which is an amazing paper in its own right. And he did a survey on the Dominican Republic cowries and described one species which had to be synonymized, unfortunately. He went to teach at Mills College, which is in Oakland, California. And it's where he met one of my, uh, I don't know if you call her a mentor or one of her, my favorite cowrieists, which is Allison Kay. And so there's a neat connection, which you never know sometimes until you start digging back into the literature. And he, I don't know if he convinced her or just made zoology so interesting, but she quit on her medical degree pursuits and went into invertebrate zoology. Ended up getting a PhD at the University of Hawaii and then working for them and at the Bishop Museum. The more modern research began in 1986 with the publication of this one we call, it's called the Red Book. The hardcover is red colored. And it was on the, the series being called the Neogene Paleontology in the Northern Dominican Republic. And this was number one, the first one published, and it was on the field surveys, the stratigraphy, the lithology, the paleoecology. With all the material, there's just hundreds and hundreds of specimens they collected were to be deposited at the Basel Museum in Switzerland. These are two of the paleontologists, which is John Saunders, who was a micropaleontologist, and Peter Jung, who is a mega paleontologist. And some of the material is pub was all published through the Bulletins of American Paleontology at PRI, the Paleontological Research Institution. And here's all the Molluscan papers that have been published. 20, there's been 24 published, and most of them have been on mollusks and some pretty heavy hitters there. The Peter Young, Emily and Harold Vokes, uh, Richard Petit, Lori Anderson, Uri Janssen, Ross Neem, Carol Hickman, Dana Geary, and Tom Waller. Uh, Alan Bue's um, volume on the Tonoidians, he included not only the Dominican Republic, but Panama, Costa Rica, and other circum-Caribbean areas, so it wasn't included in the series. Um, Non-mollusk papers were included corals, ostracods, brachiopods, echinoids, and otoliths. Hopefully we'll be number 25 in the series here. As far as time goes, the time period we're talking about is the Neogene. It includes the Miocene and the Pliocene. And this is the GSA's latest time scale from their website from 2018. I'm gonna be talking about the more in the middle to late Miocene and early Pliocene time boundaries from about maybe 17 and a half up to about, oh, maybe 5 million years ago. And this is what the stratigraphic history of the Cibao Valley looked like from the Northern Dominican Republic. You can see here's Maori's names back in 1917 and she refined them in 1919 with new names. Gab wasn't even on here. He just called it all Miocene. But you can see the same names were used over and over by all these different authors. And then late in the 60s, there were refinements in dating techniques, not just on mollusks, 
they started using benthic and planktic foraminiferans and what we call coccoliths or which are much more better for dating purposes. They call them calcareous nanoplanktons. And so you see a lot of the formations got younger and younger. And they were determined that there were time gaps in a lot of these, where there was either erosional surfaces or just periods where there wasn't anything deposited. So we use these same names today, which is kind of neat. Much more recent from 2012 from McNeil and others, the Garabo formation, the Cercado formation, the Baitoa formation. And they were able to put numerical dates on a lot of these, which is kind of neat, these formations of the Yaque group. Now, what this represents is layers of rock, one on top of the other being deposited. The formation has to be a, have a defined top and bottom and it'd be a mappable unit. And so these do, and so they do have these numbers on them now from these dates. The Baitoa formation, the oldest one was I got the dates from Hendy et al. in 2015. Harold and Emily Vokes, they were husband and wife, professors at Tulane University. Together, they've done four of these um, volumes in this series on various uh, families and sub super families, the Volutes, the Marissids, the Cardiads, and the Spondylidae. Unfortunately, Harold's no longer with us, but Emily is 90 years old now and still doing, going strong. In fact, she uh, reviewed an early course version of our manuscript, and hopefully that'll be possibly used as an official um, review as well. But they've done work in Colombia, Panama, Ecuador on the same age of, of rocks and things. This is Allison Kay and her manuscript. One of her assistants called me, didn't email me. She said, will you finish Allison's manuscript? Not can you, or do you want to? It's will you? With that kind of question, well, of course I'm going to, but I didn't realize until I saw it, how detailed it was gonna be. But she only included cypriids, the cowries. She did not include the ovalids, the trivias, or the erratos. But we still use her manuscript as a starting point. And unfortunately, she passed away before she could complete it. Um, to compare the manuscripts of just the Cypraeids, her species versus our species, ours are in the blue color, hers are in white. Sometimes we agreed on the species names. You might see the same species name across the way, but different genera. In the 1990s, some of the names were accepted like Barry Cypria Henekenai. It's now Mira Cypria Henekenai. And we have three new species. She didn't have any. So differences of opinion, differences of observations, but the same kind of fauna. Just to locate you and everybody, where is the Dominican Republic? It's right here in the middle. Shares the island of Hispaniola with Haiti. It's east of Cuba and Jamaica west of Puerto Rico and south of the Bahamas and um, a few of the other islands up there. This is the Caribbean basin. Some of the basic geology, the dotted areas here, this is all Cenozoic, meaning the last 60 or so million years. The area we're interested in is right up here where all these papers are being published from. This, the Cibao Valley along the Rio Yaque del Norte, west of Santiago, um, Dominican Republic. To go even a little bit closer here, there's four or five, six or so river valleys that branch off of the Rio Yaque del Norte, uh, the Rio Cana, the Rio Garabo, the Rio Mao, the Rio Animana, and the Rio Yaque del Norte. A little bit of paleogeography from the middle Miocene. Still a lot of good circulation in the Caribbean. The Isthmus of Panama was probably open, maybe through Costa Rica open at the same time. Hispaniola is right here. The area we're talking about is right here, making this nice big embayment, shallow water, probably very warm, probably very, very good for calories and such. Some tectonics to go along with things. Hispaniola, most of Hispaniola is on the Caribbean plate. It's kind of being pushed 
eastward by the Cocos Plate and being shoved west at the same time by the North American Plate. And what's happening, you're getting two subduction zones. The Cocos Plate and the North American Plate are being subducted, subducted below the Caribbean Plate, forming what we call island arcs. So there's a lot of volcanics here, a lot of faulting and folding, a lot of volcanics on this side. Up here, this is what's called a pull-apart basin forming the Caribbean, excuse me, the Cayman Trench. So this is very unstable tectonically, lots of earthquake activity, lots of folding and faulting. This is a Google Earth view of the major Miocene and Pliocene Cyproidian localities in the Caribbean basin. It's done by author and year of publication and number of species in the parentheses. Um, you get Costa Rica, Panama, Colombia, Venezuela, Trinidad, Caricou, uh, Jamaica, Florida, and the Dominican Republic. And if you look at some of those numbers, it's incredible how some of them are kind of low and some of them are kind of high. Ours, 26 species. That's why I said this is a Cyprioidean paradise. It would, would have been terrific in the late Miocene or early Pliocene, perhaps to be a shell collector there and be able to find all these specimens. The only other formation and area that rivals it is the Chipola formation. This was documented by one of our cohorts, Luke Dolin, back in 1991. So a tremendous amount of material from all over the Caribbean. Not as much up here in the Gulf of Mexico basin, not much in the way of Miocene and Pliocene up here in Texas or a goodly portion of the Gulf Coast. Uh, some of the boring part here, the systematics. This is the one that we followed by Boucher and others. Usually this area of the systematics is in flux all the time. Everything below class and above superfamily are usually changed almost daily. So, and they don't even call them orders or super orders. Sometimes it's they call cohorts, sub cohorts, et cetera. Usually below superfamily, things are pretty stable. We have four families here, like I mentioned earlier, the Cypraeidae, Ovulidae, Triviidae, and Eratotoidae. A little bit more recent was by Ponder and Lindbergh just earlier this year. And they introduced a term I have never seen used on any of these things. There's a mega order. Wow, that must be a big order. But you can see again, a lot of things changing here. But they use two superfamilies rather than one. We chose the one, but that's, it. that's immaterial right now. So what I'm gonna do is go through each of the families, highlighting the species that we are highlighting and describing in this paper, which will be kind of neat. And this is that same one I showed you earlier, Neoburnea spadicea from California. And I have pictures of living specimens. This is a female sitting on a clutch of eggs. And these are living images of living species taken by our friend, friend of malacology, Kevin Lee. So amazing images that he comes up with. These are the true cowries. The others are kin to the cowries, but they're called different things. Here we go with the systematics and the specimens. This is Naria acicularis. This is a recent species, it's living and it's found in this formation in the late Miocene to recent, that's pretty neat. And they're between 18 and 20 millimeters each. So they're less than an inch each, inch each. And some of them even have some original color on them, which is kind of neat. And there's quite a bit of variability. You look at some of these, they're wider than others. The aperture is a bit more in, S shape rather than straight. Some of the dentition is different, but this variability is seen in the living ones as well. So this is not some artifact of collecting. This is not an artifact of preservation. They vary. Could it be a sexual dimorphism type of thing, perhaps? Um, this is one of them that was called a subspecies of a species called Sperka at one time. And it's Bernie pointed out to me that all the work he's done in the neogene of Spain and in Italy, Sperca was not found in any of those deposits. So this may have been, this is a fanciful thought, one of these was that it was able to migrate across the Atlantic from the west to the east 
because it is found in some Pleistocene deposits in the, in the Mediterranean, but not in the Pliocene. This one's called Cypriorbis new species. Can't give you the, new, the species name because it's not published. It'll probably be named for Allison K. This is a good sized species or a good genus as well, about almost 50 millimeters. It's an extinct genus and the species is extinct. And this is the last hurrah for this genus. It went extinct after this species went left. Previously, it was middle Miocene. Now it's gonna be late Miocene or upper Miocene. Um, some color patterns still left, which is kind of neat. We had, um, how could I say it? Disagreements over this one. He claimed it was one that was already described back in 1900 by Dow from Florida. And I said, it's not, it's definitely not the same species. And so we had arguments, email arguments back and forth. And I said, it's either gonna be SP or we're gonna name it a new species. He said, fine, call it a new species. And so, ta-da, here it is. But it's, it's the last, like I said, the last hurrah. This is when it goes extinct. The genus and the species go extinct here. Showed you this one earlier, the lectotype of Mira cypria hincani. You can see some of the variability, particularly when you see these tubercles we pointed out before. Sometimes they're barely visible. Sometimes even in the lateral views, they're quite visible. So they've got that funny hump shape here and these big knobs on them. There's a genus in the Southwest Pacific called Bari Cypria. Sometimes they'll have three of those and maybe in some specimens, four. So it's quite variable. And what's interesting to note this is a living genus in the Caribbean today, but this species is extinct. It's known now by Mira cypria moose and found in Colombia, Venezuela, and Aruba. Formerly, when it was, the formations were all known to be thought to be Miocene. This was called an index species of the Eastern Caribbean. Now it's just a index species of the Miocene and Pliocene. Sometimes, and Dick has seen this one, Kathy's seen this one, Macrocypria zebra. If you know your calories, this is a living species, which would be significant. It's been kind of crunched up. Both of them have been kind of beat up. So having a late Miocene to recent species is kind of neat. Um, but when I was going to put a fanciful thought was being putting up living specimens next to all these fossil ones, and I hadn't realized that I took a specimen of living macrocypria zebra, look at, holy moly, that is not the same species. And one that we had debated about again, back and forth via email, was this one, macrocypria dominitensis. This is from, well, this is one of Gab's specimens, so it's unknown where it was from in the Miocene from the Dominican Republic. And it doesn't help matter, this specimen is missing. For the last 20 years I've tried I've asked several times various people at the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia, have you found it yet? Paul Calamon couldn't find it. And former IP uh, staff member, Katie S.D. Smargiasi, this past year said, nope, still missing. <sighs> so what do you do? Go back and look at this one. And specimen number five down there in the lower left-hand corner, that's very, very similar. Stay tuned, the jury is out on that one. We might call it the same species. We might just call it an SP. Don't wanna call it a new species, but could be. There was one other macrocypria described in the Caribbean called Trinitadensis from Trinidad. It was a very, very poorly preserved, even worse than this one, an internal mold, which is bad to describe as a new species. Nevertheless, moving on, this is Luria scenario. This is another one that's living species today. These are just over an inch long, most of them. But again, you can see that difference. Some elongated ones and some more chubby looking ones here. And again, it was thought maybe that it was sexual dimorphism with the females being the larger ones, the males being the smaller ones. Uh, I have to look back in the literature and see if there's been any examination of anatomy to see if that is, can be borne out or not. But nevertheless, the, they look like this in the modern record as well, even in our own collection here, you get this variability. So it's not an artifact of preservation or collecting bias. 
This is another one of Maori species, Luria patris patriae. It's an extinct species, but the genus is still living in the Caribbean. And when I was looking, trying to find that missing one, Dominiquensis, I saw one listed in the PRI's type list and it said Cypria Dominiquensis question mark. I thought, aha, we have one. And it was this specimen. Turns out that is not Dominiquensis. It is Maori's own specimen species of Patris patriae. So you win some, you lose some. But it was neat to have an image of this one. So we could say it's an extinct species and but living genus from the Miocene. Moving on, this is one of those wow specimens. When Bernie sent them to me, most of them are kind of small. This one's 116 millimeters in length, in that length right there. It's about the size of my fist. This is a huge specimen. And it's the genus Trona, which is extinct in the Caribbean today. And this species is definitely extinct. It now lives only in West Africa and Southwest Africa. And we're gonna name it as a new species based on its, this just colossal huge size. So even though it's the only specimen known of it, it does not look like any other species of the genus Trona. And it's got a big, well, half the dorsum's gone here and you can see a big bite out of it there. So that was a real wow moment when I unwrapped that one and saw it. Pseudozonaria Raymond Robertsi. This one was one that Pillsbury named while going through and describing and figuring all of Gab's specimens. Again, they're kind of small, about an inch in length, and it's an extinct genus and an extinct species. Now keep in mind, a lot of these are going extinct. This genus is extinct in the Caribbean. It's extinct in Europe, but it still lives today in the Panamic province on the west side of Central America and South America. Uh, Pillsbury did name another one from Jamaica called Bodenensis for the Boden formation. They're both the same species. This is another one of Gab's, Zonaria spercoides. Again, this genus is extinct in the Caribbean and the species is, but it did not make it to the West Coast. It is not in the Panamic province, but it is still known from West Africa and the Mediterranean. Some interesting biogeography going on here. Zonaria new species. This one will probably be named for Emily Vokes. Uh, this one was much bigger than any of the others. It was just so different. We just had to name it as a new species. But again, extinct genus and species. So that sums up the cowries. Quite a few of them, 11 species. Now we go into the ovulidae. They call them either the spindle cowries or the egg cowries, because some of them are that this kind of spindle shape, or one of the type species of the genus ovum looks like an egg. It's ovula ovum, this big white cowrie. Um, this type lives on gorgonians and on fan corals, and some are species specific to the species of coral as well. They feed on the polyps. So many times you don't see them unless they're on the corals themselves. So this is another one of those that this genus is alive, is living today, but the species is extinct. And this one is called Siphoma, new species. It's from the early Pliocene, about a inch in length. But this is a living species, living genus in the Caribbean and in the Panamic province of California and Central America. This one, look, we held up living specimens of it. Next to it, you could not tell the difference except for a little bit of color difference. So this is a late Miocene to recent species again. And wow, that's just incredible that you get a living species from the Miocene. More of Maori specimens. This is Neosimria wisewood A. Now this one, the species is extinct but the genus is still living in the Caribbean. And notice they're kind of getting smaller and smaller. I like the bigger specimens myself personally. Then there was a group, we had no idea where to put them. Are they with a living species or are they uh, extinct species? So we decided to play this unknowns of the genus Neosimnia, it's just called an SPP, which means it's probably two or three, maybe even four species. 
And these and they're tougher and tougher because they're getting smaller and smaller. We have some colleagues in Europe that will probably name each one of these a new species. Stay tuned. Simnialena uniplicata. By gosh, another one that was a living species. Another one named by Sowerby. It was incredible to hold those up together and see that it's identical, nearly identical to the living specimens. This is the, one of the most bizarre ovalids. This is the genus called Generia. It was widespread in Western Europe in the Miocene. It made it across the Atlantic to the Caribbean. It made it into the Panamic province in Central America. And that's where the only species lives today, one called Generia pustulata. And so it's extinct entirely species and genus-wise in the Caribbean and in West, Western Europe. Uh, so this one was early to middle Miocene. There are three species in the Dominican Republic, all from different beds. They were not found together whatsoever, I don't think. So this one was the most highly um, ornamented, very, must have been a wonderful specimen to see when it was alive. Then there was one was very, very subdued um, sculpture on it. This is called Generia gabiana because Gab thought it was a living species called Nucleolaria nucleus from the Indo-Pacific, but it's a different species and different genus altogether. So Guppy came along and named it for Gab, Gabiana. And the last new last species of ovulates was Generia pillsbrii. This one was even later. This was in the late Pliocene, or in the early Pliocene, excuse me. So three species that are all extinct and the genus is extinct. So one of my favorite groups, but they're notoriously difficult to deal with, the trivias called the coffee bean cowries. And again, another neat image by Kevin Lee of the local species, Pustula solandri. Uh, notice they're getting smaller and smaller, harder to deal with. This is Dolichipus isla hispaniole. And I think this one's a living genus, but extinct species. And this genus is also living in the Eastern Pacific. Niveria jamaicensis. This one was one that was the only specimen we have of it. It was only known from Jamaica and Barbados. So that's why it's kind of beat up looking. There was just one. And so we decided to include it as this species. Niveria sancta dominici. This is another one, the species is extinct, but the genus is alive in the Caribbean today. So they're getting smaller and smaller. This is late Miocene to early Pliocene. The next one, Pustula pediculus. This is incredible. So you can see the dorsal markings and they match stuff or look very, very similar to the living species of the same name. So another one that is of Miocene to recent range and Again, this genus and species are still alive in the Caribbean and in Western Europe, and the genus is alive in the Panamic and in California. Some genera have it and some don't. The last family is called Iratoidae. It's the teardrop cowries or apple seed cowries, and another terrific image by Kevin Lee. And this is the same specimen I showed you earlier that's now the neotype. There's four species, all of which are extinct, but in a living genus, which is living in Western Europe, the Caribbean, and in California today too. And they're getting smaller and smaller. And this is a new species, will probably be named after the formation, probably the Cercado formation. And you can tell that natissids, moon shells, were busy. That's their signature borehole to feed on the specimen that's inside. So a little bit of trivia there, even though these aren't trivias. But I'm by. Hesperado Chipolana. This is one of the Maori name from the Chipola Formation in Florida, but now it's found in the Dominican Republic. Again, it's extinct, but the genus is still living. Hesperado Domingenensis. And again, it's extinct, but the genus lives on. And the last one is another new species. 
I think it's going to be named for another one of the formations. But again, it's a living genus, extinct species. So there you've had it, this interesting array of 26 species. That's incredible in one locality in the Caribbean. So make a few conclusions here. 11 species of Cypraeidae, three of them are new, three are living. Seven species of Ovulidae, one new, two living. Four species of Treviidae, one is living. Eratitoidae, four species, two of them are new. So 26 species and six of them are new. And six of them are still living, which is incredible. Like I said, it's just amazing that these things have such a long geologic history. And what causes this? I mean, is it collecting bias? Is it um, they played their cards right? The environment was correct. It was stable tectonics at the time. Lots of corals for good reef environments and such. So some more conclusions. You get genera and species that are extinct. There are eight of them. Genus and species living, six. We've already gone over that. And genus living and species extinct, there's 12. That's some interesting numbers. And if you want to compare these to modern um, assemblages in the Caribbean today, there are only three that come close. Colin Redfern's book in 2013 on the Bahamas, he only had 14 species. LeMay and Pontier from the French Caribbean in 2017, there were 18 species. And Zong, in 2011 from Antigua, only 12 species. In particular, you look at the numbers of trivias. Like I said, they are notoriously difficult to tell apart sometimes. They'll be little, they'll be white, they'll have the same kind of sculpture on them. I don't like working with trivias, but they're difficult. And so nine species is quite a bit. And you look at the Eratos, only one species in all this area. So what's going on? Is it collecting bias? Is it big egos and you wanna name more species or is it the preservation was right? Sometimes I think it's a case of good collecting. Um, early on, Bernie went to the Basel Museum to look at the specimens which had been deposited there. And he said to delete any of the expletives, he said that stuff just wasn't fit for describing. No offense to anybody that collected them, but he said, then I'm going to go to the Dominican Republic. I'm going to collect this stuff. And so all those specimens you saw with very few exceptions, he collected all of it. And he spent, I think he said a total of two months at a time collecting and going up and down these canyons, traipsing through mud and who knows what, and found those dynamite specimens. So it was good collecting and good recognition of things. And then us recognizing that there are differences in a lot of the things. So, and we need a book on the Dominican Republic calories, obviously. There, it doesn't want to exist. Uh, Puerto Rico, there doesn't exist a good one. Cuba, there are some, but they're not really that great. So whoever said print is dead, not true. You need more books. You need more documentation of this stuff. And that's about it to acknowledge a few people here have to thank Bernie for going out of his way collecting and donating specimens. Uh, Reggie Kawamoto at the Bishop Museum for getting in touch with me and sending me all of Allison's images and copies of her manuscripts. And of course, to Allison Kay for laying the groundwork here. And I would be remiss if I didn't say thanks to my wonderful wife, now retired for Photoshop assistance, lots of advice and enduring patience and looking at these slides. In fact, the first one she saw yesterday, she said, you misspelled something. So, <sighs> Thank you, Kat. And to Dick Squires for 40 plus years, his passion for paleontology, friendship, advice on many of the things on this paper and other things throughout the years. And he's the one that got me into this business. So thank you, Dick, salute you. And now the obligatory sunset. And thank you all very much. Thanks so much, Lindsay, for that wonderful talk. Great applause. A sitting ovation.
standing ovation. I'm sure. Sitting. Oh, sitting ovation. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. Um, all right. So we do have a couple of questions. Um, so first we have Jody asks, he says, um, Lindsay, I'm struck by the diversity of superiorities. Is there one single or main characteristic that sets off superiorities from all other gastropods? And what sets off a true calorie from other superiorities? Somebody had to ask that. It's, uh, there's a lot of differences in the radulae, the feeding mechanism that they have. There are differences in mostly, in anat mostly anatomical, particularly the reproductive, um, I don't have the cladogram with me that shows that, but there are anatomical differences and radular differences that sets them off from other families, other super families. But the true calories, again, uh, it's definitely the radulae. Great. Unfortunately, Thank you so much. They, unfortunately, they don't get preserved in the fossil record. Mm. That is unfortunate. And Jody has another question, which is, I might have missed this, but when in the fossil record did the superiorities first appear? Ah, late Jurassic. They really go way back. There are some late Jurassic or what they call Portlandian, I think it is, uh, deposits in Sicily of all places. There's been two very, very tiny specimens. Um, I've never seen them in person. I've seen images of them but they're about the size of your little fingernail. So they have a long, long geologic record. They did terrific in the Cretaceous. They took some hits crossing the boundary into the Cenozoic. They've come back very nicely. Awesome, thank you so much. And so Greg now asks, Lindsay, in considering the morphological variation among the shells, particularly when comparing fossil to recent shells, can you get very many distinct characters for comparing across taxa? Yes and no. A lot of it depends on preservation here. If you have a rotten specimen, usually it's not gonna be described. That's the difference between lumpers and splitters. And like I mentioned, internal molds or what they call steinkerns, unfortunately have been many times described as new species, which many times you gotta come along later and fix that. But yes, there are characters. Um, many times it has to do with the shape of the aperture, not the number of the denticular, the, can't say teeth anymore. The teeth in the apertures, the what they call the fossula, which is in within the aperture. You got to look at all of those. And if any one of them is missing, you sometimes have to punt or go out on a limb. But yes, there are morphological differences. Sometimes you really got to search hard for them and do your homework and do lots of comparative work. And that's where some, some people just fall down and rename species and name synonyms because they don't do their homework. They think, okay, this must be new because I said it's new. That doesn't work very often. And so just looking in North America doesn't do you much good. You got to look at where they came from. A lot of these things had a Tethian origin in the eastern part of Europe, and they came across the Atlantic. Yes, but you've got to look at stuff that was on the other side of the ocean. So yes, you do look for morphology, but you've got to look at, know your biogeography left and right. That really helps. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Lindsay. And Jan has a question. She says, Thanks for your talk, Lindsay. What caused the extinction in the Dominican Republic that was the demise of some of these taxa? Good question. Do I have to answer because you're my supervisor? <laughs> I, I'm not sure. Was it the environment that wasn't right? Calories usually need a refill environment. That's where they do best. Maybe there was silting. Uh, most of these formations were transgressive meaning they were depositing, they were on lap deposits, they were depositing new formations, they were depositing new sediment. You get a regression. You get the depositing of sediment over some of these reefal deposits perhaps. Maybe it was the unstable tectonics. There was one paper I read that said that 
Miocene, there were lower rates of coral reefs. But the cowries certainly did fine without them, perhaps in some areas. So it's probably a number of things. The sedimentology rates, the habitat changes, maybe what they were feeding on. Most of them are omnivores. They'll feed on just about anything. Uh, there are some like the trivias and the erratos feed mostly on, oh gosh, very, very tiny things like forams and um, small crustaceans. So maybe it was just they couldn't find what they needed. Um, but it's interesting that some of them did well too, or end up in the panamic now instead of being in the Caribbean. Maybe a new project there. Hmm. Thank you, Jan. All right, next we have Sean asked, can you speculate why they migrated east? I don't know. Um, Gary Verme and um, Gary Rosenberg did some papers on east and west to east migration of specimens. And I think it was when the, the Gulf Stream formed and started that huge current of going west, east, I can't say west to east now, west to east across the North Atlantic. And earlier it was, didn't probably didn't go as far north. So some specimens did go east, but they never documented any Cyprioidians. It was Bernie telling me that he found, he did not find that one species, Naria acicularis in the Neogene of Spain and Italy and France until the Pleistocene, then it showed up. So that's a possibility that it took the Gulf Stream Express East. All right, thanks Lizzie. And Jody has another question, which is, are there radulae ever preserved in the fossil record? Very rarely. You have to have ultra quick burial and good preservation of these things rather quickly. Their phylogeny, not phylogeny, good grief. Yeah. Their depositional history has to be quick and nothing preying on them. And I think there have been some that have been found in an anaerobic deposits where nothing was feeding on the animal. And so radulate did get, supposedly get preserved, but I couldn't tell you exactly when. Anoxic, that's what I was trying to say. Anyways, so yes, it has happened, but it's extremely rare. And I don't think I've ever seen any of a cowrie. All right, that, those are all the questions that we have. Um, some thanks and Jody says, thanks, Lindsay, nice talk. Um, so I would like to thank you and thank you everyone for listening. Uh, it's great to have you all here with us virtually. We all wish that we could be in, in Lindsay's background right now, perhaps. <laughs> um, but uh, thanks again. And we will all see everybody next week for Jeremy Yoder's pre presentation, which I'll send out an announcement for later today. Go Dodgers. <laughs> Go Dodgers. Thanks, Allison. Thanks you, everybody.